It was a quiet summer afternoon on June 11, 2005. The sun was shining on the peaceful suburban neighborhood of Winnipeg, Canada. But little did anyone know, hidden behind closed doors, a young girl's life was hanging in the balance. Phoenix Sinclair was subjected to severe physical and emotional abuse by her mother, Samantha Keymatch, and her mother's boyfriend, Carl Wesley McKay. They callously subjected the innocent child to frequent physical harm, leaving behind visible injuries and scars. Tragically, Phoenix was confined within the walls of her home, deprived of opportunities to interact with others. Even in the face of a potentially fatal ear infection, the parents showed a disturbing lack of concern for their child's well-being, failing to provide the necessary medical attention she desperately needed. The dire circumstances surrounding Phoenix's well-being raised alarm bells among various parties involved. However, Phoenix Sinclair's life could not be saved. They promptly brought the parents into the interrogation room to unravel the truth surrounding her untimely demise. Before the interrogation commenced, a commonly used strategic technique was employed, the placement of the chair in the corner. This calculated move was intended to mentally corner the mother, inducing a sense of confinement while intensifying the pressure she felt and amplifying the sensation of being locked in. Simultaneously, it incorporated power dynamics into the interrogation, subtly influencing the behavior between the interrogator and the mother. You've done very well, Sam. You've done a good thing here, and I appreciate you being honest with me and telling the truth. You did the right thing. There's um, a couple things that we talked about that I'm a little bit confused on, though, because I, I feel like I kind of have two different stories about it, so I want to make sure I got it right and get the truth about what happened, okay? The part that you and I talked about that day uh, when Phoenix died, you were telling me about what you think killed her in the basement. Um, can you explain that again? Because you explained it one part, but you had talked before about it, and it's kind of different, so I want to make sure I got it right. So I want you to talk to me about the morning um, or the, the day that you guys were at home when Phoenix died before you went to Wes's dad's she house. Was, she was okay. She was breathing. Okay, and I and that's what you told me. But when I had asked you about what it is when that you think came, killed her. Yeah, when we came back, I said it didn't look like she, she choked on a puke. That's what I said. That looks like me. That she might have died from choking on a puke. Right. There was a puke spot there. Upon hearing the details of the interrogation, one is left questioning the circumstances that could lead a child to choke on their own puke. It is deeply unsettling to learn that Samantha and her husband failed to provide proper nourishment for Phoenix, and shockingly, even forced her to consume her own vomit. Samantha's casual discussion of the puke spot, as if it were an ordinary occurrence, exposes the disturbingly distorted perception she holds regarding parenting. Such callous disregard for a child's well-being highlights the extent of the abuse and neglect that Phoenix endured, painting a harrowing portrait of the twisted reality within this family. But then we talked about what happened down there. Yeah. And that's where I'm confused, is the time when... You talked about the puke, but then you also talked about Phoenix being thrown across the floor or thrown onto the floor, banging her head. Yeah, that was the day before. Okay, so that's where I'm confused about as what day, what thing happened. Mm -hmm. So... The, the, like, what do you mean? Like, the day before she died. So we... we we know she died on June 11th, right? Mm -hmm. So on June 10th, what happened that day? What happened to her that day? Those things you were telling me about? That's the day I was pushed her. She banged her on the floor. Okay. That's what I said. She banged her head on the floor. And right. I was pushed her. See, I thought you said that that was the day that she died. No. Okay. So this is why I want to talk to make sure I've got it right 
because there was parts that confused me about that. So on June 10th, the day before, that's when he threw her and she hit her head on the floor. Okay, so what else happened that day? Now, you had told me about hitting her in the leg a couple times with the, that bar, that pipe. I think you call it a bar, maybe? A pole. A, yeah. A pole. So did you hit her with that, that thing that day, the same day that he pushed her and she hit her head? Okay, so what day did that you hit her? That was a different day. I don't know what day that was, but that was a different day. I know that wasn't the day before she died. Okay. It was just a different day. Like, what do you mean, like, how it happened? Well, we talked about... There's nothing that happened. She was, she was breathing. She was all right to me when, before I left. Okay, so... She was, she was laying there, yeah, but she, she was breathing. By constantly emphasizing that the child was breathing, the mother may be attempting to establish that she was attentive to her child's well-being. This could be a strategy to downplay her involvement in any abusive or neglectful behaviors that directly lead to the daughter's death, thus reducing her culpability in the eyes of the investigators. And when you say she was laying there, where was she laying? On the floor. In the basement? Yeah. Okay, and that's the last time you saw her? Yeah. And how do you know she was breathing? Because I checked her. Okay, what, why did you think you had to check her to see if she was breathing before you left? What had happened? Because I had just, I always check on her. I just checked, it was just something like... Okay, because we had talked before, and you had suggested to me that Phoenix died because she choked on her puke? Mm -hmm. That might have been, I said. Okay. I don't believe that's true, and I don't think you do either. After we had talked about that, and I asked you, what do you really think killed her? And you told me that it will probably be an injury to her head. Mm -hmm. well, right? Yes. So when you had talked to me about how she got that injury, what day did that injury happen? On June 10th. And how do you know that? Because I remember that was the day. Because I remember thinking maybe, maybe that's how she died. I was thinking. So I thought maybe that's how, maybe that's why she died. Maybe because she had an injury to her head because maybe, because when she fell. Okay. Maybe, so. Maybe that was what happened. So was there anything wrong with her on June 11th that would make you think that she was still hurt from the day before? Um, because so. Wes said that he told her. No, he didn't tell her. He said... That she said she that she couldn't that she couldn't that she wasn't hungry hungry or she couldn't or she couldn't come up she couldn't come upstairs. He said he he asked her to come upstairs. She said she couldn't come upstairs. Why couldn't she come upstairs? I don't know. He didn't say why. She didn't say why, he said. All he said was that she said she couldn't come upstairs. So what happened on the morning of June 11th that hurt her where she couldn't come upstairs? In high-stress situations, individuals exhibit diverse responses. In Samantha's case, her response is marked by extreme passivity and near silence. 
She keeps her head tilted down, directing her gaze towards the ground. Her answers are delayed, and she struggles to provide coherent explanations, likely because she never anticipated finding herself in front of a detective. According to the fight-or-flight response, some guilty suspects tend to be excessively talkative, attempting to create an impression of innocence. Other cases may involve suspects being unresponsive, crying, or completely shutting down. Samantha, however, seems to be in a confused state. She appears visibly devoid of emotions, taking ages to come up with a response. Except you know, and I know I'm that something... I'm trying to rem remember it, and... Trying to remember it. I don't know, I don't... So when you said that you went to check on her... Yeah, when I <clears> checked on her, she was okay and breathing. Now she was breathing, but was she beaten up? Was she hurt? I think maybe she was hurt. Okay. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't tell, like, because we, like, she was just laying there and she was breathing. Just like when somebody's just laying there. I don't know when somebody's just laying down. Okay, so you... She was okay when I looked at her. The perception of normal behavior can vary greatly among parents, but for Samantha, the sight of her own child bearing bruises and enduring daily abuse appeared distressingly ordinary. Astonishingly, Samantha's disturbing perspective suggests that she believes Phoenix to be in an acceptable state. Such a statement is deeply unsettling, highlighting the distorted mindset and alarming disregard for the well-being of a child. Okay, so she was alive, you say, when you looked at her. Now, when you think she was kind of hurt, what made you think she was hurt? So I was thinking maybe, thinking maybe because of her head, maybe. I was wondering about that. Okay, and so are you telling me that nothing happened in the basement that before you went, that nothing happened to her in that basement on June 11th? Because you had said before that you weren't the one that beat her. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, who beat her? And you said it was Wes. Yeah. And we were talking about that day. I said he beat her. But, but like, I said he beat her. All I want you to do, Sam, is tell me the truth. I'm telling you the truth. I didn't beat her. Okay, and I'm not saying that you did. I'm asking you to tell me the truth about what happened before you went to his dad's house that day. I don't... Yeah, I checked on her. She was okay. She was breathing. Did somebody beat her that morning? Or earlier in the day, before you went to his dad's, did somebody beat her? Like from the time when we were gone and the time we got back? No. From before you went. You and Wes were still home, Daniel was there, and Phoenix was there. Before you and Wes left. Oh, yeah, I said, uh, yeah, I said Wes beat her, but I didn't say he beat her that day. I'm talking about the day before. Okay, I want to know what happened that day. That day, I think, I think that day, I think he told her to have a shower that day. That morning, I'm not sure. Unless I'm thinking of another day. But I don't... Did Phoenix get hit before you and Wes went to his dad's? I'm not sure. I never, I never hit her, though. I didn't hit her. Was Wes downstairs with her before you left? He was down there with her. And what was he doing down there? 
Not sure. It is at this moment that Samantha attempts to shift the blame onto her partner, Carl McKay. She claims ignorance about the events that occurred in the basement, asserting that Phoenix likely met her tragic fate shortly after Carl went downstairs. However, investigations uncovered a disturbing truth. Both Samantha and her partner played a role in the abuse inflicted upon Phoenix. Samantha herself was complicit in the mistreatment, engaging in a range of harmful actions that inflicted severe harm upon her daughter. These included neglecting Phoenix's basic needs, depriving her of adequate food and clothing, and subjecting her to physical, emotional, and psychological abuse. Even if the child's death could have been prevented, the trauma she endured inflicted long-lasting scars on her mental and emotional well-being that could have never been erased. That's when after he told me that she didn't want to and she said she couldn't come upstairs. Okay, so he was downstairs with her. He came up, and that's when he told you she said she can't come upstairs? He told me, yeah, she couldn't come upstairs. He asked her. He said he asked her to come upstairs and eat, yeah, to eat, and she said she couldn't. Okay, so then is, did you go downstairs and check on her? No. So after he came up and said she can't come up and eat, what happened? I didn't think anything. Though so maybe she was just too lazy or just tired to, or she just didn't want to. Okay. Because that's what she sometimes she wouldn't want to eat. Sometimes. Okay. Phoenix suffered from severe malnutrition due to regular food deprivation. Additionally, Samantha frequently subjected Phoenix to physical abuse. One instance involved Phoenix, likely experiencing hunger, secretly eating bread while her parents were unaware. Upon discovering this, Samantha responded by physically assaulting her child. It is appalling to consider that the fear of punishment for simply eating may have led Phoenix to willingly choose starvation over facing further abuse. Samantha's explanation that Phoenix didn't want to eat, implying she wasn't hungry, is a deeply disturbing statement that reveals the malicious mindset of Samantha. So then you went and checked on her before you left? Yeah, I checked on her before I just went down there. Okay, so did you see her again after Wes had come up and said, you know, I asked her to come and she says she doesn't want to? Did you see her again after that? No. Okay, so then you guys went to his dad's? So that when you got home, what is the first thing you did when you got back home? Went downstairs. And what did you see when you went down there? She was laying there. Where in the basement was she laying? On the floor. By the... Like on the left, like when you come down the stairs, mm -hmm. this way, but kind of by the wall. Okay. Is there any windows in the basement there? Yeah. So from where the window is, where was she laying? Like where in the basement, when you come down the stairs, where is the window? The window is over here. So it's to your left? To the left by the... By the wall. Okay, so where was Phoenix laying, like, in relation to the window? It was, like, kind of, like, this end. Was so she near the same wall as the window? No, it was, like, um, how do you explain it? Was she near a wall or in the middle of the floor? It was kind of, kind of, kind of in the middle of the floor. Instead of providing Phoenix with a proper bed, she was subjected to sleeping on the cold floor of the dimly lit basement. This space, originally intended for storage, was filled with broken furniture, discarded belongings, and neglected appliances like washers and dryers. The distressing reality of a child being forced to reside in such an environment, typically reserved for storing unwanted items, is profoundly troubling. Okay, so you went downstairs and she's laying on the floor. Um, how was she laying? She was laying on her back. 
Okay, did she have any clothes on? So when you guys went down there and you found her naked laying on her back, is that when you said that Wes tried CPR? Once Samantha is confronted about the lifeless body, her demeanor changes. She becomes visibly disturbed, shifting her position and turning away from the detective, avoiding direct eye contact. Her gaze often drifts towards the ground, and she lets out an audible sigh when questioned about the circumstances surrounding her daughter's death and burial. The incomprehensibility of a mother inflicting such harm upon her own child raises questions and evokes a profound sense of disbelief. While there may be arguments suggesting Samantha's troubled background as a product of the child and family services system, marked by a history of abuse, dysfunction, and potential psychological problems, it still remains a chilling testament to the depths of depravity required to commit such acts against one's own flesh and blood. However, the darkness does not end with Samantha. We are soon introduced to Carl Wes McKay, Samantha's partner, who is revealed to possess a similar malevolence. Notably, Carl's probation officer described him as hostile and difficult back in 1999, hinting at a troubled and volatile nature. It is worth noting that Carl is not Phoenix Sinclair's biological father, but he lived with Samantha during the period in question. Following Samantha's interrogation, Carl is brought into the room as the investigation begins to uncover the extent of his involvement in this tragic case. Phoenix. She was in your life, right? Yeah. She was in your life. But because of whatever was going on in life, pressures, medication, whatever it may be, things got a little crazy, right? Did you mean to do that to her? Did you mean to go that far? Or was it one of those situations where a nice guy made a mistake? Wesley, did you mean to do that to the Phoenix? Did you mean to do that purposely? Or was it just something that was beyond your control? Did you? Did you do that on purpose? Because if you did that on purpose, I can't understand. I can't understand. Did you do that to her on purpose? Or was it something that was beyond your control? The detective is employing a common tactic by offering McKay a chance to shift the blame for the repeated abuse inflicted on Phoenix and, ultimately, her tragic death onto external factors. This approach aims to make the suspect believe that their actions might be somehow justifiable. However, it is important to note that any confession made in the court of law, regardless of how it is rationalized, holds significant weight and cannot alter the legal consequences of one's actions. The purpose of the tactic is to gather information and obtain a truthful account of the events, rather than to absolve the suspect of responsibility. Was it beyond your control? Nobody controlled it. Nobody controlled it? Who controlled it? Who controlled it, man? You're a good man. You are. Who controlled it? Huh? Who controlled it, man? She didn't have to do, she didn't, she didn't have to die like that. Harry, do you agree? Yes. It's horrible, eh? You know what, I'm glad I see you like that because you know what it tells me you have feelings. You care. I'm happy to see you like that, man. Because you care, I know you do. That's why I'm sitting here with you. You care. You do, you're a good man. Doesn't matter what anybody says, you're a good man. The detective demonstrates exceptional skill in employing an empathy-building tactic. By expressing the phrase, you care, you are a good man, and offering a consoling touch to Carl's shoulder, the detective effectively establishes rapport and connection during the interrogation. This approach acknowledges Carl's positive qualities and validates his emotional capacity, fostering a greater sense of trust and cooperation. It can also appeal to Carl's sense of moral responsibility and encourage him to reflect on his actions in a more introspective manner. How come it happened? Just, we know it happened. We know it happened. Why did it have to happen? Hmm? You don't know? Do 
you regret? I can't, I can't think right now. I know. Do you regret what happened? Tell me you do. Do you regret what happened? Yeah, I regret. Do you? Whatever I did in my whole life, I regret it. Yeah. If you could change one thing in your life, what would you change right now? Right now? Huh? I know my lawyer advised me to say nothing. I know. But you know what? All the lawyers do that. And that's right. That's that's your legal obligation. But you know what? There's You have values that that are speaking out. You have values, right? There's things that you need to get off your chest. And I know. That's why I sat, sat here with you this long. I know. I could have walked out right away. But I know what you're about. I know you feel bad. I can see the tears, and that tells me a lot. I'm not judging you, okay? I'm not. I'm not judging you at all, and I won't. I know you've had a shitty life, okay? I know you've had a shitty life, and I don't expect you to be perfect. What? I just want to worry about my children. I know you do. I know you do. And you know what? I know you do, and that tells me a lot. You should be concerned. If you weren't concerned with them, if you weren't concerned about them right now, I, I, I don't know what I would think about you. I know you're concerned. You had two kids, two beautiful kids, right? Rain and Damien. They must mean the world to you, hey? Yeah. They do, I know they do. I don't know, I'll never see them again. Oh, come on, hey, look at me. You will see them again. Don't say that. You'll see them again, okay? You know what, you've taken a big step here, okay? You've taken a monster leap, all right? That is awesome. You are you are a decent fella, whether you think so or not, okay? Okay? Hey. Hey. I, I, don't, I don't have any animosity against you, okay? All right? You did a good thing, okay? Hey. Yeah. It was... Get it out. And then I tried to save her. Yeah, what'd you do? I tried to give her CPR. Yeah. And what happened? She would come to No. That must have been hard, eh? That must have been hard. Feel free, man. Yeah. I, I made a big mistake. The statement, I made a big mistake made by Carl during the interrogation, holds considerable importance for both the confession and the subsequent court trial. Not only does this statement indicate an admission of responsibility for the actions related to the case, but it can also be used by the prosecution to strengthen their case against him. It shows that Carl is aware of and accepts his role in the incident. However, similar to the previous interrogation of the mother, the detectives are ultimately aiming for a complete confession to get a detailed account of the events, motivations, and other important information. I know, but you know what? I got a for it, so... But you know what? You know what? You're owning up to it, right? Right? The good fellow that you are, you are owning up to it. You realized you made a mistake. Right? Yeah. You did make a mistake. I made a mistake. You did. And you know it, and, and you're talking about it, and that's awesome. That's great. How, what, what was it that set you off that day? I mean, we all have pressures in our life. Okay? Was it, was it medication? Was it stress? Was it people bothering you? Was it fear? Was it, what was it that set you off? I don't know. What the, what the, I'm sorry? I don't know. I just... I don't know, it's, it's such a, it's, uh, it's a tragic thing. It is a tragic thing, but you're taking a first step, right? As I said earlier, today is the first day of the rest of your life, right? Okay? It's important for you, and you know what? Your family will see it as like, wow, he's, he took ownership of this. He didn't try and hide. Carl McKay had a family of his own, including children from previous relationships. While the specific details about his family and children are not extensively discussed in the context of the Phoenix Sinclair case, it is known that he had a son named Daniel. Daniel played a significant role in the trial as a key witness, 
and tragically, was the one who discovered Phoenix's lifeless body in the basement. The abusive behavior of Carl McKay was likely evident and known within his family, and through the trial, it was ultimately exposed for all to see. You know, that tells so much about your character, okay? Even though with all the crap that you've been through in your whole entire life, it tells so much, tells volumes, speaks volumes about your character. When did this happen? Hmm. When did this happen? You probably remember the date. No, I, I'm just thinking back here. Yeah, what my mother said. Yeah, take your time. She says, try not to get too involved in this relationship with Samantha. Yeah. How come? She was right. How come? She, because she knows, she knows her mom. Okay, your mom knows Samantha's mom? Samantha's mom. Yeah, yeah. who's that? Uh, her name is Bertha. So there's some stresses going on in your life, right? It was, uh, you know, when, when I first told her to come and stay with me. And, right. You know, I didn't even know she had a, had a kid. You, know? oh, you didn't know Samantha? No, I didn't know she had a kid. Oh, really? Okay. Next thing you know, you know, she, I go to her mom's and her kid's there. And, right. And, Is that Phoenix you're talking yeah, about? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I just wondered if this was her kid. And, but right. she was staying with her mom. Right. You know, I thought myself first time and Samantha was uh, just single, I didn't know she had any kids. And, right. And, I don't know, she, she wasn't very, um, I don't know, she wasn't very good with her child anyway. Samantha wasn't? No. No, how come? I don't know, I just don't know, maybe the anger in her or something. Yeah. In a revealing moment, Carl opens up and offers his perspective shedding light on the dysfunctional dynamics within the family structure. He acknowledges the distressing reality of physical violence inflicted upon Phoenix Sinclair. In contrast to Samantha's reserved demeanor, Carl becomes more talkative, yet he falls into the pattern of deflecting blame, mirroring the previous interrogation. Carl avoids delving into his own direct involvement in the acts of violence. Instead, he purposefully distances himself from the violent incidents and explains that he initially did not know that Samantha even had a child. Crafting a narrative that portrays himself as detached from the conflicts at hand. You know, the biggest mistake was this... I mean, I can't say that she moved in the kid. The kid was like a mistake. Right. You no, know, she should have stayed with her grandparents, you know, and I, I just lived this life of being her. And, it, you know, when, when I found out she was pregnant, you know, that shocked me. And yeah. I... Uh, I tried so hard to, you know, you know, keep her happy. Right. You know, uh, but this tra tragedy has totally uh, turned my life. I bet it has. It must be weighing thin on your nerves, eh? Since then? No, oh, it's, I don't know, it's, uh... I mean, it's kind of been bugging you. It has been. Yeah? It's, yeah, every night. Yeah, I bet it has. Sometimes uh, I listen to the music. One time yeah. I went like this, and then I heard Phoenix's name, you know, right. like it's out of the blue. Right. And uh, just kind of, you know, made me think. Yeah. When is this going to make her, you know? I was scared. I bet I you were. Scared. You know what? Yeah. Anybody in your shoes would be scared. If I would have been in your shoes, I would have, who knows, maybe I would have done the same thing. We, we don't think properly when in high stress situations, do we? We don't. While the specific details of his past are not elaborated on, McKay's upbringing, family circumstances, and personal struggles likely contributed to the challenges he faced. These factors could have influenced his behavior and contributed to the tragic events surrounding Phoenix Sinclair's death. You know, who's responsible here? You or Samantha? I don't... To me, uh, it's both of us. It's both of you? Yes. How is it, how is it both of your fault? Explain to me. I don't know, she would always tell me to tell that kid to keep quiet. Okay. That day, was she telling you to keep the kid quiet? Oh, uh, no, she was downstairs. I think at the beginning she was downstairs, because we were going to go out. Okay. To, to go see my dad. Right. So she put her kid in the corner there. Is this in the basement? In the basement. Yeah. Okay, so she she put her kid in the basement because the kid wouldn't keep quiet? Yeah. Yeah. She, she, she's a mean mom. Right. Yeah. She had no heart. No way.
Phoenix Sinclair's biological parents were Steve Sinclair and Samantha Keymatch. However, shortly after her birth in April 2000, Phoenix was placed in the care of her great-aunt and great-uncle, Kim and Robert Edwards, due to circumstances that are not fully disclosed. In 2004, Samantha Keymatch entered into a relationship with Carl McKay. During this time, Phoenix was still under the care of the Edwards family. However, in June 2005, Samantha and Carl took Phoenix from the Edwards home without legal authorization, effectively removing her from the custody of her original parents. It is important to note that while Carl McKay may have made derogatory statements about Samantha's character, it is crucial to acknowledge that he was also complicit in the illegal removal of Phoenix from the care of the Edwards family. This act eventually led to Phoenix's tragic death, as both parents subjected her to severe abuse. I know she loves, she loves my babies. I bet she does. Well, she made a mistake, too. Yeah, well, you both made mistakes. You're not perfect, right? Yeah, I'm not paying for this. Well... You did a good thing by talking about it, though. You know that, right? Because the good person in you, right? The good person in you is talking about it, right? Yeah. And you've had to keep this in for so long. I don't know how, like, I don't know how you, are you on special medication because since that incident? Or no? No, all of a sudden. No? So tell me, explain to me how it happened. I can't remember. It's Try and remember for me, okay? I don't remember the. I can't hear you. I don't even remember the story. We just. I don't know. Fucking, she put her in the corner. I don't know what the fuck. She came out of the corner. And then Phoenix. I got, yeah. Yeah. And then I grabbed it. I threw her on, on, on the clothes. There was a bag of clothes I threw on there. I said, you know, listen to your mom, I said, so I, we went and we left, and then he said that this little girl was breathing anymore. Yeah. I came back, back as fast as I could. Yeah, I know what you did. <laughs> did I try revive her? Yeah. But it didn't work? <laughs> and then it, we were scared. I bet you were. And then I told her, and then she said, let's, let's go bury her somewhere. Okay. Who is responsible here? You or Samantha? I don't... To me, uh, it's both of us. It's both of you? Yes. While Carl suggests a certain level of guilt, he stops short of fully accepting responsibility for his role as an abusive father. One particularly disturbing aspect of Carl's interaction with his child was his twisted version of playtime, known as the chicken game. This game was not only dangerous, but also extremely sadistic. Carl would lift Phoenix Sinclair and grip her by the throat, intentionally pushing the boundaries to see how far he could go before she lost consciousness. Child and Family Services had hundreds of pages of documentation referencing red flags to Carl's prior acts of serious violence, criminal record and implications in a child abuse act. At least twice before Phoenix was murdered, social workers were made aware of the presence of him living in the family. But tragically, they did not make the connection. It paints a grim picture of the family dynamics, extent of the torment inflicted upon the innocent child, and the disturbing reality that the parents managed to elude justice until the tragic act of her murder. What time of day was this? This is in the evening. About what time? It was starting to get dark. Yeah? About nine, it was ten. Yeah. Did you ever go back there? No. You didn't go back and look? No. Is the body still there? I don't know. Well, if you didn't go back, would it still be there? I don't know. Is there anything on top of it right now? Just uh, soil, I guess. How about snow? Snow, yeah, there'd be snow on here, I guess. What direction in the dump? Is it right in the dump, or is it on the outside? No, it's on the uh, dump, in, in a bush somewhere. Okay. You'd be able to take me there? Yeah. Yeah? yeah. Really? Yeah. Okay. I appreciate that. I just want this. Over. I know you do. I know you do. And you know what? You're doing a good thing. I know you do. You're doing a good job. On June 11, 2005, Phoenix Sinclair tragically lost her life after enduring prolonged physical abuse and neglect over the course of several years. Faced with the lifeless body of their child in the basement, Samantha Keymatch and Carl McKay made the disturbing decision to wrap her up in plastic 
and bury her in a garbage dump near Fisher River, Manitoba, Canada. This act allowed them to attempt to move forward with their lives while concealing the tragic reality of what had transpired. Her death went undiscovered for nine months as her caregivers continued to collect Fisher River and then provincial welfare benefits. Concerns arose from social workers at Child and Family Services who had prior involvement with the family. During their visits to the home and ongoing interactions with Samantha Keymatch and Carl McKay, they were unable to locate Phoenix and received inconsistent and misleading information about her whereabouts. Recognizing the gravity of the situation, the social workers reported their suspicions to the police, triggering an investigation into Phoenix's well-being and whereabouts. Nine months after her death, on the 18th of March, 2006, Phoenix Sinclair's body was finally found. The date is uh, March 17th, the year 2006. The time right now is um, 9.46 p.m. We are leaving the garbage dump road, uh, and Wesley, Carl Wesley McKay, is going to take us to where Phoenix Sinclair is buried. Um, we're going to videotape um, leaving the road, the garbage dump road, into where she is buried. Um, and once we get there, um, uh, there'll be some more commentary, and uh, we'll conclude there. All right. location. Um, Carl Wesley McKay is, uh, is going to take us exactly to where uh, Phoenix Sinclair is buried. It's in here or right in here. I know it's in here. So. Okay. So at that point, we're, we're standing there. The trial shed light on the extensive abuse, neglect, and unimaginable suffering inflicted upon Phoenix by her own parents, Samantha Keymatch and Carl McKay. Daniel, the son of Carl McKay who occasionally visited the family, bravely testified about the appalling conditions Phoenix endured. He revealed that she was systematically deprived of basic necessities, such as food, and recounted the chilling details of Samantha Keymatch's threats when he attempted to feed Phoenix. Daniel's testimony painted a devastating picture of a once cheerful and plump little girl who had become alarmingly skinny by April 2005. Despite Keymatch and McKay pleading not guilty to charges of first-degree murder, the overwhelming evidence presented in court left no room for doubt. They were ultimately convicted of a range of charges, including child abuse, neglect, unlawful confinement, and first-degree murder. The court recognized the severity of their crimes and handed down a sentence of life in prison with no eligibility for parole for 25 years. The trial served as a tragic reminder of the depths of depravity that can exist within some individuals, as well as the urgent need for a robust and effective child welfare system. The case highlighted the significant failures within the welfare system and child protective services, which failed to intervene and protect Phoenix from the torment she endured. It stands as a haunting testament to the importance of improving the safeguarding of vulnerable children and ensuring that no child falls through the cracks of the system again.